Okay, good afternoon all. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's 1 p.m. Uh, thank you for joining this panel discussion on the revised Rental House Act regulations hosted by the District of Columbia Office of Attendant Advocate. Throughout the course of the discussion, the attendees will be on mute, but OTA's Education and Community Outreach Team will be monitoring the chat, and we will be passing those questions over to our panelists when we arrive to the question and answer session. With that said, um, please allow me to introduce the Chief Tenant Advocate for the District of Columbia, Johanna Shreve. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. This happens to be a, a, an important day for us and for the city. Uh, it is the first public forum that the Office of the Tenant Advocate is holding in the fiscal year of 23. And I am very, very happy to have Dan Meyer from the Rental Housing Commission with us today. Uh, as well as Joel Cohen, Director of Policy for the Office of the Tenant Advocate, Joey Trimboli, also the Legislative Counsel for the Policy Division of the Office of the Tenant Advocate. It's important for us to be able to provide you, the tenants of the District of Columbia, with educational opportunities and outreach information that we believe that is important to your day-to-day -day living experience. Today's experience is one that is going to be of great value to you because based on the effective date of the regulations that you will hear today, they started in December, almost a year ago, December the 21st of, 19, of 2021. So we are happy that you are here with us today. And with me also is the interim chief person of the Rental Housing Commission, Lisa Gregory. Lisa and I have been talking for the last several months about this forum, and I am very pleased that she was able to take time out of her busy schedule today to join us. So I'm gonna ask Lisa to join in now and to provide some brief comments before we turn the panel over to Joel. Lisa. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Joanna, for inviting the Rental Housing Commission to be a part of this training panel. Um, I am Lisa Gregory. I am the interim, interim chief judge of the Rental Housing Commission, and we are very excited. Dan has a very detailed uh, uh, training PowerPoint to share with the community about how the Rental Housing Commission operates and what are the new changes that affect their ability to get redress or to get their disputes uh, resolved. So thank you so much, Joanna, for allowing us to participate and um, let's have a great day. Thanks, Lisa. And now let me introduce the host for this afternoon's panel. Joel Cohen has been a member of the OTA staff for the past 14 years. Joel served with uh, in council member uh, Graham's office uh, many, many years ago, but joined our team in 2007 and has been a vital part of the operation, handling all of our policy matters, which is one of the greatest and most important features within the Office of the Tenant Advocate. So, Joel, with that introduction, I'm turning the show over to you, Dan and Joey, and let's go. Okay. Thank you, uh, Director Shreve. Uh, nice to see you, Judge Gregory. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. As Johanna said, I'm Joel Cohn, Legislative Director at the OTA, and I'm joined as panelists by Dan Mayor, General Counsel of the Rental Housing Commission, and Joey Trimboli, Legislative Counsel on the OTA's policy team. Uh, today, we are discussing the Commission's comprehensive rewrite of the regulations for the Rental Housing Act, which, as Johanna said, took effect on December 31st of last year. Uh, the agenda is as follows. First, I'll take four to five minutes to explain the run of show and provide some legislative and regulatory context for the discussion. Then Dan and Joey will take up to 20 minutes each to highlight some of the key changes. Dan from the Commission's neutral arbiter perspective and Joey from the tenant advocacy perspective. Uh, we'll, we're going to do our best to save at least 30 minutes for the Q&A. Please use the chat function to send us your questions whenever they occur to you. Uh, and as Cristobal uh, began with, uh, he and Nicole McEntee will collect questions from the chat and pose them to the panel during the Q&A. I will now discuss the legislative context for our topic. The Rental Housing Act of 1985 is the district's key tenant protection law. 
It establishes a wide range of tenant rights, including those related to evictions, rent control, and the registration of all rental units. The Act also establishes the Rental Housing Commission. The Commission has two key roles. First, deciding administrative appeals from the tri-level decisions of the Office of Administrative Hearings. And second, more relevant to today's discussion, issuing the implementing regulations for the Act, including, of course, any Council amendments to the Act. Over the last 15 years or so, the Council has extensively amended the Rental Housing Act. For example, in 2006, the Council completely overhauled uh, the rent control program, rent ceilings were abolished and replaced by a system where rent increases must be based on the rent charged. In 2017, elderly and disability protections were added. The social security cost of living adjustment became a further cap of rent increases for elderly and disability tenants and low income elderly and disability tenants were exempted from having to pay surcharges for all types of housing provider petitions. In the dozen or so years after rent ceilings were abolished, unlawful uh, so-called de facto rent ceilings became a problem. So in 2018, the council provided a definition for the term rent charge, namely the amount of rent the tenant actually pays. And that number is required to be placed on any rent adjustment form. Uh, I will now discuss the regulatory and rulemaking context for the discussion. Uh, the Commission's implementing regulations for the 1985 Act were first issued in 1986. Before the new revisions took effect at the end of 2021, the Commission had amended the regulations only a couple times and only in relatively narrow ways. So by 2016, the job of revising and updating regulations had become a monumental task. That's when the Commission initiated a, an impressively methodical and comprehensive approach to getting the job done. It developed draft rulemaking. It set up a collaborative interagency review process, which included the Office of the Tenant Advocate, the Housing Provider Ombudsman, the Rent Administrator, and the Office of Administrative Hearings. Extensive comments were received from this interagency group, and the Commission met with the group to discuss problem areas. Between 2019 and 2021, the Commission issued three separate proposed rulemakings. It received public comments on each, including further comments from the OTA. It included in each proposed rulemaking a detailed preamble explaining the commission's reasoning behind each of the important changes it made to the previous version, including responses to specific comments. So if the process was lengthy, and it was a five-year process, at least five years, it was also comprehensive, collaborative, highly responsive, and highly detail-oriented. The product was a 211-page final rulemaking, the first major overhaul of the regs in 35 years. I'll mention that the regulations are codified in the DC Municipal Regulations at Title 14, Chapters 38 through 44. And I will now uh, give a, a brief introduction for Dan Mayer. Dan is the General Counsel again for the Rental Housing Commission. As General Counsel, Dan did much of the legwork and heavy lifting for the project, it's evident that he carefully thought through each and every provision and indeed each and every nuance of the regulations. Uh, I'll also say due to its scope and the direct impact on the lives of so many residents, I believe this is among the most important rulemakings in the district's history. Uh, Dan, uh, with that, the microphone is yours. Hi, okay, thank you, Joel, for that uh, great introduction and overview. Uh, I am Dan Mayer, General Counsel for the Rental Housing Commission. Um, glad to be here today and really want to thank OTA for having us at this. It's a great opportunity for our uh, relatively small agency to uh, get the word out to people and, and use OTA's great education and outreach resources uh, to help educate the public. And let me mess with the technology here for just a second. And we are sharing and we are starting the slideshow. I hope everyone can see that. Somebody on the panel jump in and yell at me if you can't. Uh, I want to start by just giving a uh, overview of some of the acronyms that are going to come up in this because it's full of acronyms um, and it's also a good opportunity to just kind of 
give a quick overview for those who don't know of what the processes look like under the Rental Housing Act in general. Um, you'll see RHC or the commission, which is the Rental Housing Commission. Um, primarily the commission acts as an appellate court uh, in disputes that come between tenants and housing providers. Most of that is uh, specific to rent control or rent stabilization under the Rental Housing Act. And those uh, petitions, they're called, those cases get started when a petition is filed at RAD, the Rental Accommodations Division of DHCD. From there, uh, they get transferred over to OAH, the Office of Administrative Hearings. Now, this was a change that went into effect in 2006. Uh, it used to be that the rent administrator, uh, who is the head of RAD, uh, issued decisions on those petitions without it going to OAH, but uh, there was a change that happened there. Uh, it's a kind of trial type hearing process that's going to happen. Uh, OTA, of course, I think you all know and love. Um, some of the petitions that can be filed under this, um, first, you can have tenant petitions, which are kind of complaints that a housing provider might have violated the act, or you can have a housing provider filing uh, hardship, capital improvement, service and facilities, substantial rehab, or voluntary agreement. And these are requests for kind of special rent increases that are gonna be more than the ordinary CPIW increase, the annual inflation-based rent adjustment. That's usually a few percent um, that I think most people are familiar with on an annual basis. And I just wanna mention the term housing provider. Um, sometimes you'll see it shortened to HP also. Um, just, you know, sorry, there's two HPs under the act. Um, but that's a term that means generally a landlord or a management company, property owner, an agent of the owner, the landlord, the company. Uh, it's a catch-all term that I'm going to be using mostly because it covers the whole universe of however it is that somebody has set up their rental housing business. It's all housing providers for our purposes. Uh, Joel mentioned a little bit about this. Uh, with why the commission undertook this whole long process in the first place. Um, there are some specific ideas and they kind of generally fit into two sort of categories, one being those legislative changes that Joel was talking about, um, abolition of rent ceilings, OAH taking over the hearing function, and uh, nearly 23 or 24 other fairly significant pieces of legislation that came through um, both before and while we were in the process of updating this. Um, and that led to really an opportunity because it had been 30 years since the last major update. So, uh, you know, the whole world really has changed from 1986. You have things like email now on the internet um, and, and plenty of other changes and lots of experience really through um, those petitions and cases of what was working, what was confusing, uh, court decisions that had overturned some of the rules or clarified what some of the rules meant. Uh, so it was a real opportunity to just make the rules better and a little more user-friendly, or at least hopefully they're a little more user-friendly now. And I'll talk generally about uh, several of these uh, major issues. I can't possibly go into every single detail. Some of this gets down to you know, a deadline that used to be 10 days is now 15 days or, or whatever those little changes are, but I want to focus on the biggest picture stuff um, that you have listed here. I'm not going to go into too much detail. I think Joey will talk a little bit about some of the individual housing provider petitions. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on the big process issues that went into how we revised those rules. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, abolition of rent ceilings and the change to regulating the rent charged. Uh, this was really uh, one of the biggest points, fundamentally kind of rethinking the way rent control worked in the district, which required us to really go through and, and from the biggest picture to the tiniest details, rework some of the regulations. Um, under the old system, you had this process of, you know, a rent ceiling adjustment that you request, that you file, notify the tenants, and then you adjust the rent charged, and that goes through all these steps. And if you just, um, believe me, we tried, go through the regulations and swap the word ceiling for charged, it turned into this weird circular thing that you, you couldn't figure out what you were supposed to do if you were a housing provider or if you were a tenant, what your housing provider was supposed to have done. Uh, so really, we had to kind of rewrite that whole process there. And 
uh, we got tons of public comments on this, understandably. Joel mentioned um, what was uh, kind of the rent concession issue that I'm sure a lot of you probably heard a lot about, uh, which was essentially an interpretation of the change in the Rental Housing Act and what was supposed to be filed and what was the amount that you could adjust the rent. And so for writing rules that would clarify what everyone was supposed to be doing, um, you know, that kind of phrasing part of it was really important. And I think what the commission ultimately came down with was a pretty clean, clear, legally sound solution, which is that as we were writing them, uh, we started by, we're going to just say rent. And then if and when, and when is most of the time really, but when you need to clarify adding in charged, demanded, increase, decrease, lawful, unlawful, add in those qualifiers later. Um, you know, of course, this did raise concerns because people were very focused on the importance of the rent charged. Um, and ultimately, Joel was mentioning um, these long discussions that the commission put into each notice of proposed rulemaking, um, talking about its reasoning and responding to public comments. And so in there, there is a part where the commission, don't ask me at this point, which <laughs> notice it was, I think the second or third, um, or the, the discussion says specifically, we understand the concerns and this is designed to effectuate getting rid of rent ceilings. So nothing is ever perfect. No rules can ever be perfect. Somebody might try to find some loophole somewhere. We understand that, but the general principle is if you're using these rules in a way that looks like a rent ceiling, talks like a rent ceiling, walks like a rent ceiling, or if the wind starts blowing stuff over in your yard, um, sorry about that. Uh, if it looks like a rent ceiling, uh, then that's not what these rules are supposed to be working as. You, you sh should be interpreting them in a way that doesn't have that effect. So following on from that general principle of um, getting rid of rent ceilings, uh, a rule that the commission added here um, in these new uh, rules is that you have to uh, increase the rent within 12 months of becoming eligible to increase the rent. Under the rent ceiling system, uh, once you were approved for a rent ceiling adjustment, you held on to that forever. And in getting rid of the rent ceilings, uh, what the commission did was uh, to make it so that there's not an unlimited amount of time. And the question then is, what is the limit? And the commission settled on a 12-month period, which is not coincidentally the same as the rule of how often you can increase the rent. So you might get into weird situations of the rent went up on one date and then a rent ceiling increase comes in at a later date, um, but you can't raise the rent because it hasn't been 12 months. But once you come full circle, then you'll still be within that window. We can get into some of the specifics if anyone wants to in the Q&A. It can get fairly complicated. There are a couple of little exceptions that are noted here um, where it sort of doesn't really make sense to limit it to 12 months or to go as long as 12 months. Next slide. Uh, one other point I want to make that uh, the Rental Housing Act has always had a lot of notice and filing requirements that go along with it um, as sort of regulatory checks on how much the rent is going up by and making sure tenants have notice of all these things. Um, so a rule was added um, that you now have to, as a housing provider, use the government published form uh, to notify tenants about rent increases. It used to be that as long as you got all the information in there, you could write a notice to tenants um, on your own letterhead or however you want. Um, but because of some of the complications that have come along with rent charged, rent surcharges, I'll talk about in a second, um, it, it's cleaner and easier if everything is just on the same government form. And uh, part of this process, I, I won't go into details on all of these forms changes, but we've been working since the rules went into effect with the Rental Accommodations Division on getting all the forms updated to match the new rules. And that's been a really important and again, kind of a slow and deliberate process, uh, specifically because really those forms are going to be 
the most touch that most people have on the Rental Housing Act, on the regulations, on how the rules have changed, it's going to be in the forms and in the instructions. That's going to be the main point of interaction. So it, it's been a quite a process getting those up to date, um, but that's really been very important. Uh, to start talking about the housing provider petitions, um, I think uh, Joey wants to talk specifically about some of the issues around rent surcharges, but as I alluded to, um, not only did the act switch to regulating rent charged from rent ceilings, in 2018, the uh, council went in and in making some reforms uh, protecting uh, elderly tenants and tenants with disabilities, generally defined rent increases from certain petitions as surcharges that aren't counted towards the rent charged for other purposes. So this was, uh, we, we'd already started the process of revising the regulations and kind of got an extra uh, twist thrown in there uh, halfway through the process. Um, but again, making sure that every usage of rent charge, rent surcharge, rent, rent adjustment, making sure all those lined up uh, turned into quite the project. Um, the process then also for housing provider petitions, as I mentioned, changed from the rent administrator to OAH, which is an independent agency, and we can't exactly tell them what their process has to be, but we can do our best to set out kind of timing of how things get transferred over to them um, and do a better job in explaining the standards that they're going to have to apply in those cases. Um, one of the changes then that we also made was to clarify that um, every petition with a couple small exceptions does go to OAH for a hearing, even if tenants don't show up to oppose it, the housing provider basically has to show up and you know swear, yes, the paperwork that I filed is true and accurate and I am entitled to this rent increase that I'm requesting, but also spelling out more of what the process is for letting tenants know that they can come in and make those objections to the uh, housing providers petition, uh, which had never really been set out. It was kind of done in practice of how the agencies handed it off. So we kind of codified that and, and made a few tweaks to it to improve the process and make sure everybody gets a fair opportunity to be heard. Um, and again, without going into all the details on each type of petition, I'll say most of them really end up kind of looking like accounting problems or tax law problems. It, it's for very detailed and kind of mathematical formulas that go into each and doing our best to spell that out and define things as they've been defined in you know, 30, 40 years of cases that have been decided under the act um, where the old rules didn't fully explain everything. Um, part of that also includes um, housing code violations. I'll talk a little bit more about housing code violations in a minute, uh, but clarifying that um, that is a basis for objecting and stopping a housing provider petition. And also uh, there had been, it was kind of maybe a technical point, but it was a very confusingly written part of the act about whether housing providers had to get an inspection before requesting a petition. Um, which is not required, uh, but we can talk more about if people want in the Q&A on, on how you can object based on housing code violations. Now, voluntary agreements then are a little different uh, from other housing provider petitions. And um, in part, we almost don't need to talk about this right now because we're in the middle of a two-year moratorium on new VAs getting filed. But if they do come back uh, next October under recurrent law, um, new rules will apply to those. The commission did go through, uh, make a lot of changes to this process, actually. And this was probably the second biggest source of public comments that we got after the rent charged issue. Uh, the old rules were fairly unclear on some process issues with negotiations between housing providers and tenants. Uh, and this is an, issue, an area where you can definitely have different groups of tenants with different interests, as well as the housing provider having their own interests, um, possibly purchasers of the building having interests. So it can get a little complicated there and the old rules were not workable uh, for that process. So now the negotiation is kind of work out whatever you wanna work out, but once you've filed the application, that's when we're gonna start setting some pretty strict 
um, deadlines and waiting periods and notice requirements that everybody has to be on the same page. And an important part of this, I think, is um, that if there are any kind of side deals or inducements that some tenants are getting or all tenants are getting uh, in order to sign the voluntary agreement, that those have to be disclosed uh, to RAD, to the other tenants, to the Office of Administrative Hearings. Everybody has to be on the same page. There's no hiding the ball about what the deal is with the agreement. And all of that will be considered uh, towards uh, whether the agreement and the rent increases in the agreement are ultimately reasonable. And I, this is something near and dear to OA, OTA's heart. So I think they want to talk more about what goes into that reasonableness determination. Um, but we did make it clear that OAH is looking at whether or not the agreement is reasonable. Uh, let me jump right to this slide here on excuse me, tenant petitions. This is then the process for tenant complaints about violations of the Rental Housing Act and, and rent control generally. Uh, there's a few examples listed here of how the commission rewrote the rules for tenant petitions. And the common thread of these really is not that they were changes fundamentally to the law or what you can complain about, uh, but spelling out things that really, unless you're a very experienced attorney in this area, you might not know or understand what some of these standards are um, and how these standards apply in the rental housing context. Um, and the act definitely depends on uh, tenants representing themselves and representing their own interests a lot. So it's very important that um, even if it results in a fairly lengthy list of things that you can complain about and process details, that it is all spelled out somewhere in writing that doesn't require a lawyer or legal research into you know, years of case law that may make it clear what uh, a willful violation of the act means, but you, you how could somebody be expected to know unless we've written it out? So we tried to make sure that was written out as clearly as possible uh, for what tenants have to prove to win on their tenant petition uh, or what housing providers have to prove uh, when a tenant complains about something. And I just wanna bring up housing code violations then because one of the things that tenants can complain about through a petition is housing code violations. Uh, the commission's not in charge of the housing code or anything like that. We're not the Department of Buildings. Uh, we don't issue citations for it, but the Rental Housing Act incorporates the housing code um, by making uh, maintenance of the property a related service that a housing provider can't eliminate. And if they do, a tenants are entitled to a rent refund. And so there was a lot of clarification to be done around this. The district has really modernized the housing code since 2013, uh, what's now called the property maintenance code. It's an international standard that's been slightly modified for the district. Um, so incorporating that language into our rules and uh, making some changes to what's called the statute of limitations, or at least better explaining the statute of limitations, which says that you can only complain about something through a tenant petition within three years of its starting. Um, housing code violations being a little different from services and facilities in general. Uh, and this gets, we actually had some confusion that the commission really had been responsible for. We had cases going both ways as to whether you could get a refund for anything in the last three years, or if, for example, you'd had rats for more than three years, that meant you couldn't complain about rats anymore. Um, but I think ultimately there, there was a case, uh, it was kind of complicated of how it resolved it, but it did resolve the issue. And we have spelled it out now in the regulations that it's any time within the last three years, you can't, um, you can't claim, well, you've had rats for too long to, to file a tenant petition. That seemed like a really kind of odd result. And that is not the rule. Uh, more generally, um, as Joel mentioned, every uh, housing accommodation in the district has to be registered for rent stabilization um, or uh, to claim an exemption from rent stabilization on the registration. And uh, this has resulted in a lot of litigation actually about when a registration is filed, how do you give notice to tenants uh, and uh, 
consequences of somebody who is thought they were exempt and uh, had not actually given proper notice. So we've clarified a lot about this and changed the timing of giving tenants notice to make it easier to follow and make sure really the tenants have the correct version of the document. And I know Joey also wants to talk about um, this cooling off period, the waiting period for rent increases. Um, that was something very important to OTA through their uh, comments. Uh, but we did clarify um, if somebody is exempt or should have been exempt uh, when they can start acting like they're exempt after correcting uh, the previous failure. And, and I'm not hitting every bullet point on these. So please, if you do see something, absolutely put that in the chat and we will talk about in the Q&A some of these details. Um, I think I'm, I'm over my time already, so I'll try to move as quickly as possible. Um, evictions, this again is something that applies to all tenants, all rental units in the District of Columbia. Um, the council hadn't really changed too much until recently about uh, the law around evictions, but the commission does regulate and uh, does write the rules for the content of notices to vacate, which is the starting point of evictions, even though we don't actually hear eviction cases at the commission. Uh, but we went through and really clarified as best we could our old kind of vague, really broad rules and, and made it really point by point of what needs to go into each type of notice, um, the detail required, some of the rules that had developed in case law around uh, a couple of the uh, ones that have been sources of controversy, personal use and occupancy, um, when TOPA rights have to be given and how that relates to notices to vacate, um, because several of the reasons that you can start to evict a tenant uh, also trigger TOPA rights. So that, that was something where we had to line up our part of the act with separate law and make sure that it was all clear. Uh, additional tenant rights, a lot of this has been passed by the council in recent years, and so it was just new additions to our regulations. Uh, cleaning up a bit about retaliation, too, that's something that I think the old rules weren't terribly clear on. We've seen lots of cases where people are arguing retaliation back and forth between housing providers and tenants. You can't retaliate against the tenant, but what exactly does that mean in practice? Um, how is a judge supposed to look at those cases? We really tried to clear that up. Again, please, uh, Q&A, because I'm over time, if anyone wants to talk about it. But lastly, this is near and dear to my heart, um, is the appellate procedures of how you argue a case in front of the Rental Housing Commission after you've gotten a decision from the Office of Administrative Hearings. Um, the uh, case of stays, whether an OAH order is effective while it's pending on appeal to the commission, that's actually a source of confusion going all the way back to the 1986 regulations. Uh, immediately, the Court of Appeals issued a decision um, saying that in part those rules were wrong, and there was another decision and another decision. It's very confusing, and the rules were never updated to reflect any of that. Um, but ultimately, the commission now has a rule in place that uh, neither rent refunds nor rent increases are um, orders that you can enforce if they're still pending on appeal. Um, a lot of these other issues here I just want to mention are um, attorneys will probably know what I'm talking about if I say Rule 11 sanctions um, or uh, attorney's fees and the case law around that. Um, but this is all about um, how you argue in front of the commission and creating a, a fair process that makes it a lot easier for um, people representing themselves or being represented by counsel uh, to know what the rules are. Um, and since I am uh, definitely over my time here, why don't I hand it off to Joey? And uh, if we want, we can talk about where the commission is uh, with fixes to these rules going forward into the future, how they're gonna um, be impacted and um, some more changes that the council passed just earlier this year around evictions and tenant screening and where the commission is going um, on rules to implement uh, that new law without having to do a 211 page final rulemaking, um, but something a little more narrowly focused. Um, so with that, why don't I end my part of this. And uh, Joel, do you want to introduce Joey or Joey, do you just want to take right over? Joey, why don't you uh, start right in? 
Sure. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, just give me one moment while I share my screen with you all. All right. Presentation. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks to Dan for that great overview. And thank you all for being here. My name is Joey Tromboli. I'm a legislative counsel with the Office of the Tenant Advocate. Uh, I work with Joel in the policy branch. And today I will be highlighting some of the new regulations that are of particular interest to the OTA and for which we advocated specifically to be included uh, in the new rules. So uh, with that, first of all, I will talk about rent increases, specifically forfeiture of rent increases after 12 months and vacancy increases. So forfeiture after 12 months, what this means uh, rent adjustments, except for vacancy adjustments that are approved but not implemented, will now expire 12 months after authorization. This 12-month rule exists because of the statutory requirement in the Rental Housing Act that prohibits landlords under rent control from taking more than one increase in a 12-month period. So this was important to OTA because allowing unimplemented rent increases to linger and be potentially implemented at some far-flung later date essentially preserve a rent ceiling system and rent ceilings have been abolished to protect tenants from unexpected large rent increases. Uh, the lingering unimplemented rent increases have become basically de facto rent ceilings between their official abolition in 2006 and 2016, when OTA engaged the interagency process of drafting new regulations. And on vacancy increases, landlords must now file with RAD within 30 days of a unit becoming vacant in order to secure a vacancy rent increase. And landlords must file again within 30 days of a tenant taking occupancy after the vacancy if the tenant is charged a lower amount than what was originally registered. On housing provider petitions generally, uh, I'm going to talk about the term surcharges, uh, which Dan alluded to. So rent increases pursuant to hardship, capital improvement, and substantial rehabilitation petitions, as well as voluntary agreements and services and facilities rent increases for protected tenants. Uh, protected tenants are uh, elderly tenants and tenants with a disability. Uh, these are all now defined as surcharges, and this is in order to separate them from the base rent and exclude them from the calculation of standard annual rent increases. So for example, if the rent for a unit is $2,000 and there is a $300 surcharge for a hardship petition, any rent increase will be calculated based on the $2,000 rent and not the $2,300 total of the rent plus the surcharge. And this is important because the existence of a surcharge as a result of a housing provider petition is not intended to thereby uh, then inflate the standard annual increase even further. So moving on to registration and claims of exemption. Uh, a landlord's failure to register and notify the tenant. Uh, Dan alluded to this as well. Uh, so just to elaborate on that, if a landlord fails to register the unit, or apprise a new tenant of the rent control exempt status of the unit, the rent may not be increased until 90 days after the landlord registers the unit. And this is called the cooling off period. Uh, and the tenant receives proper notice of the rent control status. Uh, this is important for giving the tenant a fair chance to understand and respond to the kind of rent increases they'll be facing depending on whether the unit is registered as rent controlled or exempt from rent control. Maybe that the tenant, upon finding out the unit is in fact exempt from rent control, uh, needs to, you know, move or prepare for the rent increase uh, or what have you. And the rule also provides an incentive for landlords to comply with this important notice requirement. Moving on to Rental Housing Commission procedures. Uh, stays of decisions uh, that have been appealed, automatic stays of decisions. All final orders to pay a specific amount of money that are appealed to the commission will now be automatically stayed pending appeal. And it was important to the OTA to make sure this rule was balanced. Earlier versions of the proposed rule mostly automatically stayed decisions in cases where it was generally more to the landlord's benefit. And we're happy that the final rule will stay all appealed decisions with orders to pay some amount of money. Um, and the final orders of the Rental Housing Commission will be posted to its website. Uh, this is important for accessibility to the commission's decisions and ease of use for anyone who might want to see what the commission decided in a particular case and why. Uh, because, of course, that can affect the outcome of future cases down the line. 
And on the subject of housing code violations, I'm going to cover four items. That's uh, substantial housing code violation examples that are now listed in the regulations, mold, rules of evidence, and the statute of limitations for challenging housing code violations. So uh, for the examples of housing code violations, the non-exhaustive list of substantial violations of the housing code has been updated in the Rental Housing Act regulations to reflect the property maintenance code. Uh, so this is important for us at the OTA. Uh, we have a seat on the property maintenance technical advisory group within the construction codes coordinating board. Uh, this body drafts the local property maintenance code. Um, and we are particularly concerned uh, with the ability to one-stop shop when looking at laws and regulations. Uh, there should be appropriate cross-referencing so that someone looking at the regulations doesn't feel the need to go look at 10 different regulations and reconcile them. So we have examples of uh, property maintenance code, housing violations um, listed in the housing code. So you can find those there. Examples include frequent lack of water supply, frequent lack of hot water, uh, frequent lack of sufficient heating, hazardous electrical systems, exposed wiring, leaks in the roof and walls, uh, among others. And on mold, a violation of the indoor mold regulations will now be a substantial housing code violation regardless of the circumstances. Moving on. Rules of evidence with respect to housing code violations. Tenants will be permitted to testify orally before the Office of Administrative Hearings or OAH or the commission regarding housing code violations that were abated more than one year prior to the hearing. So no longer will the tenant be limited to testifying about violations occurring within the last year. And finally, on this subject, the statute of limitations, uh, where a landlord reduces the services or facilities in a building or unit, and in doing so creates a substantial violation of the housing code that is still ongoing, the tenant may recover a rent refund going back as far as three years, even if the violation initially began more than three years prior. So previously the statute of limitations cut off tenant claims three years after the initial reduction or elimination. So, so now it will be three years from when the tenant uh, learns um, uh, that uh, the, um, Housing code violation uh, is, uh, is occurring. So housing provider petitions in general, um, we're going to talk about the exemption for elderly tenants and tenants with a disability and retaliatory petitions. Um, the exemption for elderly tenants and tenants with a disability, uh, these tenants are exempt uh, from petition surcharges. Uh, however, this exemption is subject to annual tax credit funding allocated by the mayor and the council. Uh, this tax credit funding is there to compensate landlords for the rents they forego due to this exemption. Uh, unfortunately, what this means is that if the funding runs out in a given year, this exemption is no longer going to be operable. Uh, this is not the fault of the regulations. This is a statutory law to which the regulations have to conform, um, but that's just for your information. Retaliatory petitions, uh, under the rules, tenants may challenge housing provider petitions as being retaliatory. And this previously applied only to services and facilities petitions. Uh, it's important for the regulations to be very explicit that a housing provider petition may be retaliatory and that tenants can challenge such a, such a petition. So uh, hardship petitions, one of the various housing provider petitions. Uh, I'm going to talk about the term maximum possible rental income uh, and something about the way this is calculated in determining a landlord's hardship under the petition. So where a landlord wishes to increase the rent via a hardship petition, the landlord must show its maximum possible rental income over the previous year. If this number is higher, then the landlord's calculated hardship will be lower. Landlords will now be required to include unimplemented rent increases in their maximum possible rent income calculations. So what this means is they will not be able to increase rents under a hardship petition to make up for increases they chose not to implement in the past four or so years. On capital improvement petitions, uh, I'm now going to talk about uh, three aspects of these, selective implementation, horizontal stacking, and exceptions and objections. So selective implementation. If a landlord wants to continue a rent surcharge for the purpose of making capital improvements beyond the initial 64 or 96 month surcharge period, the burden is on the landlord to demonstrate good cause for failing to recoup their costs up to that point. 
The landlord must provide detailed reasons for having failed to recoup its costs by executing a certificate of continuation with RAD. That's the Rental Accommodations Division at DHCD. Uh, and good, good cause no longer includes inequitable implementation of the surcharge on specific tenants or rental units or on classes of tenants or rental units. So this discourages landlords from shifting costs under a capital improvement petition away from some tenants at the expense of others, uh, i.e. what we call selective implementation. So also on capital improvement petitions, horizontal stacking. Tenants can contest a capital improvement petition on the basis that the improvement is substantially related to an improvement already subject to a separate capital improvement petition, such that simultaneous implementation of both would circumvent the 15% or 20% statutory rent increase limit. This will help prevent horizontal stacking or the practice of exceeding the limit on rent increases under a capital improvement petition by essentially splitting a set of related improvements into two petitions with two separate rent increases. Exceptions and objections uh, with respect to capital improvements. A tenant now has 30 days to submit exceptions and objections to a continuation of the capital improvement petition instead of the previous 15 days. So this is really important for us. It gives tenants a more reasonable amount of time to consider the petition and present their objections. Now moving on to services and facilities petitions. Uh, I'll talk about three things here, mandatory fees, the statute of limitations uh, for challenges to a services and facilities petition, and tenant testimony on conditions. So mandatory fees. Mandatory fees for services and facilities cannot be charged and the service or facility cannot be reduced or eliminated without approval through the petition process. Here the commission is implementing legislation passed by the council that the OTA, OTA actually spearheaded. statute of limitations for challenges to a services and facilities petition uh, is three years, and this three-year statute of limitations would begin to run when a tenant knows that the service or facility will not be restored rather than the time uh, which it was shut off. And uh, for example, if a service or facility was shut off a year ago, but the tenant just learns today that the service or facility is not going to be restored, then the tenant has three years from today to challenge the rent increase that was meant to compensate for that service or facility. And just quickly on substantial rehabilitation petitions, I have one point on these, uh, on tenant testimony on conditions. Uh, a substantial rehabilitation petition must be in the interest of the tenants in order to be approved. And to that end, testimony by tenants is now admissible with respect to the physical condition of the accommodation. And now on to voluntary agreements. So with respect to these, I'll talk about the cooling off period, the new reasonableness test for voluntary agreements, uh, the fact that a tenant cannot vote on the voluntary agreement where uh, they have a direct or indirect ownership interest, and all contested voluntary agreements would be reviewed by the OAH or Office of Administrative Hearings. So the cooling off period, um, similarly to what I discussed under capital improvements, uh, after the voluntary agreement is filed and served, tenants will have 30 days to consider the agreement before signatures can be collected. And this increases that cooling off period from 14 days um, to 30 days. And just as I talked about under the capital improvement context, um, this extension of time for exceptions and objections uh, allows more allows tenants uh, a more reasonable amount of time to consider the voluntary agreement and uh, deliver their objections in a well-articulated way. The reasonableness test for voluntary agreements. Uh, the commission created this new test, which includes the interest of the tenants and other relevant criteria. So the OAH, the commission, and courts of law will content, consider this set of factors in determining whether APA is reasonable. Uh, these factors include capital improvements or deferred ordinary maintenance, including reserve funds, the cost scope and nature of related services and facilities, other costs identified in the voluntary agreement, rate of, rate of return, comparable nearby rents, relocation plans, cost attendance, including the rent burden, other terms of the agreement or side deals, 
and disparate rent increases between uh, units or tenants. And no vote where direct, uh, I should say indirect ownership interest, uh, tenant may not vote if the tenant has a direct or indirect ownership interest in the property, that's on a voluntary agreement. Uh, this is intended to prevent tenants with a conflict of interest from voting on the voluntary agreement. And lastly, all contested voluntary agreements will be reviewed by the Office of Administrative Hearings. So RAD will not issue a final decision on a contested voluntary agreement. Instead, OAH will decide on an agreement's validity in an adversarial court-like process in which both sides are represented. So those are OTA's highlights of the new rules. Um, and with that, that's all for my portion of the presentation. Uh, I thank you all so much for listening and I hope this was informative. I'll now turn it back over to Joel Cohen, OTA's legislative director. Thank you. Great. great. Uh, thanks so much, Dan and Joey. Those were great presentations. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions, but I want to turn it over first to our education outreach team to pose questions from the chat. So Nicole and uh, Cristobal. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, we actually have several questions in the chat. Um, so I will begin with those and we have some pre-submitted questions as well. Um, if you have anything right now that you haven't yet submitted in the chat, please feel free. Um, both the chat and the Q&A are open and we're monitoring both. Um, so first of all, we have a question. Can you say more about the tenant's right to organize? Um, I'm not sure who wants to kind of jump on that one, but you know, were there any changes or additions or uh, details uh, regarding the tenant's right to organize? Sure, why don't I, I'll, I'll start on the regulatory part of it. And Joey, if you wanna talk more generally about tenant rights to organize, um, this was something that was passed in, oh, I'm gonna forget which year the council passed this, like 2007, I think. Um, setting out some specific rights about tenant organizers um, coming into buildings, <clears throat> um, when that can be done, um, and how the provider policies around organizers in buildings. Um, the regulations and what is now section 4304, uh, for those who are curious, or it's section 506 of the Rental Housing Act, uh, the regulations mostly um, just reiterate and spell out what's in the Rental Housing Act itself. Um, the part where the regulations add some bits um, is around enforcement and penalties of those and how those are calculated, um, the kind of orders that can be issued um, by OAH if there's a complaint by a tenant, uh, tenant or tenant association uh, that wants to file a petition about it. Um, I don't know if, Joe, you want to talk any about what some of those rights are that are in the act or, but that's maybe a longer conversation too. Uh, let's see, without those at top of mind, I think I might kick that over to Joel if he uh, might want to answer that question. Sure, yes. Yeah. So um, yeah, the, the Tenant Right to Organize Act was a uh, Jim, Jim Graham initiative, uh, then it's close, is either 2006 or 2007. And essentially, uh, ensures uh, the right of tenants collectively to have an association, uh, to have meetings at reasonable time and places within the accommodation, the right to bring in uh, outsiders, advocates, and uh, leafleters um, to help the, uh, the association's cause. Uh, they have the right to, uh, let's see, this is uh, testing my, my memory here, but also the, the rights basically to express grievances to the landlord and uh, have uh, essentially good faith efforts be made by the housing provider to um, at least listen to the tenant association's complaints. Um, there are also uh, you know, penalties involved for violating um, the Tenant Right to Organize Act, uh, which I believe are, are actually indexed to the cost of inflation. So it's um, I forget if it's ten thousand dollars per uh, violation. Uh, that I'm, I would need to check on that. But um, it's an important law. I think probably underutilized, um, and um, I think that's a great question. So thanks, thanks for posing that question. All right, thank you. Um, the next question we have here is. Um, 
if one thinks that the rent charged is higher than it should be, what are the options to address this? And whoever wants to kind of jump on that. <laughs> Can you repeat that question, Nicole? Yes, I'm sorry. If one thinks that the rent charged is higher than it should be, what are the options to address this? So I'm assuming this is kind of, you know, what should I do if, if the landlord continues to try to use a de facto rent ceiling? I'll, I can just go ahead and say, come to the OTA, talk to an attorney advisor, check the, check the math and check your rights and uh, options. If um, you're probably talking about a rent controlled unit, um, file a tenant petition and um, uh, it will be heard at the Office of Administrative Hearings. Uh, if you lose, you can appeal to uh, Dan Shop, the Rental Housing Commission. Thank you. Um, so the next question would be, so if the funding runs out for tax credits, elderly and disabled tenants will not be exempt from substantial petitions? So yeah, I can answer that one. Um, uh, that's right, the exemption from petitions uh, for elderly early tenants and tenants with this disability depends on that tax credit funding, annual tax credit funding. So uh, once it runs out, the exemption is no longer available. And uh, unfortunately offhand, I don't know uh, the, uh, you know, the amount that's left over for this year or what have you, but, um, but that's the case, yes. Yeah, it's roughly, I think a million dollars indexed to inflation, I think um, every year that's available. Um, the, the sort of process is um, if you have, if you are a tenant who is 62 or older or has a disability and a qualifying income, and you have registered that with the rental accommodations division, um, and we didn't get into anything about the process of doing that, but we did some work to spell out that process and they've uh, been working hard on getting the forms up to date for that. Um, then the housing provider can't charge a surcharge uh, to those tenants. Um, if the Office of Tax and Revenue discovers that credits that would pay the housing provider for that, if that's run out, um, then they can start charging it. I believe, and don't quote me on this, but it hasn't happened yet. So the <laughs> exact process and timing of who sends a letter to whom when um, hasn't totally been worked out in the past, so. Okay, um, the next question is, are you working with the city to stop voluntary agreements? And just for some background, if you could provide additional context as to, um, you know, kind of what's going on right now with voluntary agreements, um, you know, and why they might be problematic. Definitely a, a Joel or Joey question there. At the commission, um, we have to, follow what the law is that the council has passed. So for example, as I was mentioning, voluntary agreements are still in the act, but temporarily on hold. So um, from our perspective, what we needed to do was make the rules, the best rules that we could under the statute, um, if and when that comes back, as far as um, permanently eliminating them, that's absolutely uh, an OTA question. Joey, do you wanna tackle that first or would you like me to? Uh, I'll just start off, off and say, yeah, you know, we, uh, there's currently a moratorium on voluntary agreements till I believe October of next year. Uh, we did advocate for that. It will have been a two-year moratorium. Uh, we're hoping that um, it will become permanent. Uh, voluntary agreements are often characterized by uh, you know, unequal bargaining power uh, among the landlord and tenants and as many as 30% 30 30 of the tenants in a property can uh, be against the voluntary agreement and it still go through. Um, so I'll let Joel continue from there. If there's anything else to add. So there has been over the years, a number of legislative proposals to basically men's don't end voluntary agreements. Um, uh, some of them drafted by the OTA and advocated for by, by our chief tenant advocate. Um, over the years, it's become quite evident that VAs are um, just a very difficult beast to, to control. Um, and uh, at some point, the chief tenant advocate, I, I do believe was on record as uh, 
uh, coming out in favor of, of abolishing the VAs altogether. Um, I will say that the regulations uh, and the reasonable cost factors was um, a very good thing uh, that um, OT had advocated for, and we thank the commission for incorporating. It doesn't solve the whole problem because there's a statutory provision, um, section 215C of the act that limits what the commission can do in terms of ensuring that any rent adjustments approved uh, pursuant to a voluntary agreement is actually reasonable. And that provision says, if the landlord uh, uh, is, uh, submits a proposed voluntary agreement that increases the rents for all units, not by a dollar amount, but by an across the board percentage amount, it's automatically approved. Uh, and it must be automatically approved by um, the rent administrator, now the Office of um, Administrative Hearings. Uh, there's no policy rationale that we can think of for that. Um, and it um, lends, a, it's a provision that kind of lends itself to an obvious uh, reform, but also um, I think speaks to, uh, goes back to some of the factors that um, kind of, um, you know, militate in favor of abolishing voluntary agreements. So that will probably be a legislative um, discussion that's going to be had after, as Joey says, the moratorium expires towards the end of 2023. Thank you. Um, the next question is, do these changes all apply to HUD subsidized properties? Um, so no, uh, if there is a HUD subsidy, that's one of the exemptions from rent control. Um, so I've been mentioning about filing your registration or your claim of exemption. Uh, so a building that has HUD subsidies um, and including uh, housing providers that are taking, uh, for example, housing choice vouchers. Um, there is a little clarification around the process of that, but it is part of the Rental Housing Act that um, where there are government subsidies, then that takes precedence over rent control uh, under district law because it's basically a, a separate and federal rent regulation process. Uh, so there have been a lot of clarifications that the council has made and that we've made to the process of um, what the rent becomes if the subsidy ends or what the timing is for, for claiming that you're exempt because of the subsidy. But generally speaking, things like uh, housing provider petitions or the rent charged issue or surcharges, uh, that's not gonna apply for HUD subsidies. All right. Um, the next one is, and I think this one is for you too, Dan, are any of the rent control forms being revised? And if so, which ones and when will they be available? Yeah, um, RAD did get um, immediately right before December 31st last year um, when um, rent increases were coming back into effect after the COVID moratorium and the rules were going to effect. Um, they did get a, a versions of um, it's form eight and nine, if you're familiar, um, the rent increase forms, and they got versions of those up pretty quickly. Um, some, I think the registration form is up. I, there's been a, a thorough review to make sure everything is correct. Um, the commission has gone in and made a few technical fixes to clear up some of the language that was in the December rules. Those are um, currently in place on an emergency basis to help RAD get its job done of updating the forms um, thoroughly. Um, but uh, I think we're hopeful, they're hopeful. Again, I don't wanna speak for a separate agency, but from conversations with them, um, hopefully soon um, a full slate of recently revised forms will be up. There are some that are revised that are up now um, and you know, making sure all of the little details are right. Um, again, because of some of these complications of what needs to be on it, what tenants need to know, and to make it as clear as possible uh, to read and for housing providers to complete them accurately. Um, so hopefully a, a total slate of revised forms, I think, soon. Um, okay, the next one is, is there a division or section of RHC that's responsible for, for the substantial task of enforcement of rent control law, or does the burden of enforcement exist solely within the OAH petition process? 
So the yeah, the commission is we are very small. Um, there are three commissioners and uh, five uh, full time employees at the commission. So we don't have an enforcement division within the commission. Um, and because the appeals of uh, enforcement actions would come to us, that would be kind of a weird conflict. Um, the rent administrator is uh, kind of a frontline enforcement person. They do have uh, some authority to initiate um, hearings and reviews on their end. The primary mechanism, again, they're also a fairly small office within DHCD. Uh, so the primary mechanism really is and, and always has been um, for tenants to enforce their own rights, um, tenant associations to come together, uh, representatives like OTA provide legal assistance and other um, legal aid groups that can help tenants filing petitions in that process and opposing housing provider petitions. Um, could you please expand, sorry to have all of these toward you, Dan, but uh, I think this is you as well. It says, could you please expand on comments about codifying case laws regarding willful violations of the Rental Housing Act? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, so the Rental Housing Act itself um, has a few different standards for um, what the penalties are once you've determined that a housing provider violated the act. Um, these are include knowing violations, which is actually kind of the lowest standard, bad faith violations, and then willful violations. And um, even though the statute itself only just says knowing bad faith and willful, um, that kind of left it to the commission and to the courts over the years to figure out what that meant. Um, these are terms that are really common um, in other areas of the law. Uh, willful kind of depends on which area of the law you're in, what exactly willful means. Um, but the commission and the courts over the years have kind of settled on what is a fairly high standard of intending to violate the law. I uh, mean, you know, I knew that the Rental Housing Act said I couldn't do this, and I think I'm not going to get caught, so I'm just going to go ahead and do it anyway. I think that would kind of be one uh, example of how willfulness would work. And if there's a willful violation, that's when you can get fines of up to a thousand, uh, up to five thousand dollars per violation, um, as opposed to um, knowing violations, which uh, has been interpreted as just I knew what I was doing. I knew what the rent was and I knew how much I was raising it to even if I didn't know that it was illegal um, that's enough to get the tenants a rent refund for that amount and if it was bad faith again that's kind of years of fleshing out in cases case by case um, what is or isn't bad faith um, that can get you um, triple rent refund okay the next question I'm going to throw to Joey or Joel so Dan can take a breath <laughs> Um, this is, uh, do capital improvements cover renovations to individual units? Um, and then she gives some examples. Uh, will these renovations allow the landlord to charge a capital improvement rent increase on these units affected, even though the renovations weren't made to the entire building? Uh, Joey, do you, uh, again, do you, I can tackle that if you wish. Uh, I'll give that one to you, Joel. <laughs> okay. Um, so the answer is yes. And that is uh, to say that it's a capital proven petition can be generally for the whole building, but can be for uh, less than the whole building. It, that in that the improvements apply only to presumably a unit or you know, less than 100% of the units in the accommodation. Um, the major difference is that that particular capital improvement petition actually under the statute, um, Dan might want to weigh in on uh, any regulatory, um, I guess, elaboration on it. But uh, within the statute, I believe the best interest of the tenant um, is a required criteria for approving the, the less than the full building type of petition. And a second important difference is that um, the uh, cap on that particular surcharge, a CI surcharge, is 15% if it's less than the whole building, whereas it's 20% of the current rent charged for each unit if it's um, a building-wide capital improvement um, uh, petition. Thanks, Joel. 
Um, the next question is, are you working on including air pollution and smoking in the housing code? And I'll throw that to Joey or, or really anybody, I guess. So I'll, I'll speak to that uh, as well, Joey, if that's okay. Sure. I, I, Joey, Joey's actually done a lot of great research. On, it's an important question that's come up. Um, uh, uh, multifamily dwellings are just sort of notorious uh, for uh, ventilation systems that allow for the migration of smoke from one unit into another unit. Uh, sometimes it's even more direct than that. There's secondhand smoke problems in terms of tenants um, not being considered of their neighbors in common areas. Um, it's a, a difficult issue. Uh, there are jurisdictions. Um, I want to thank um, one of our uh, guests today, uh, uh, TA President um, Ms. Gill, who um, pointed us to jurisdictions that do have laws that restrict or ban smoking in um, multifamily dwellings on the basis that um, secondhand smoke is difficult to control and it's and it's harmful to, to health. Um, the, we also, you know, conversely, it's a bit of a difficult issue for OTA. There's something of the tenant versus tenant element to it. Um, we're not the health experts for the District of Columbia. And um, the uh, there are others who are, of course, health authorities that would be better able to speak uh, to the issue um, in terms of the overall impacts. Um, and um, I guess, um, you know, um, merits of having a ban of, of that nature in the district. Uh, there are resolutions to those types of problems, at least on an individual basis, because um, tenants who have that complaint sometimes do get redressed where it's one unit affecting another unit and they're, they're sort of one-off situations more or less uh, where the um, resident manager or landlord can step in and sort of speak to both sides and come to an agreement about uh, the you know, uh, places within the unit that the tenant smokes and avoiding the, you know, the, the ventilation system as much as possible. That's not a very compelling uh, solution for some folks, but that is to say that it's a complicated issue. Uh, and it is one that we've uh, looked into and um, are having discussions about. Um, ultimately, it does seem as though there's going to have to be a health expert uh, that speaks to that issue um, rather than have that be an OTA issue because it does involve the rights, current rights of um, tenants on opposite sides of the issue, um, at least where it's in, you know, not a non-smoking building. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Joel. Um, the next question is, some buildings have substantial numbers of tenants with vouchers. Um, do rent control tenants bear the burden of the full surcharge? Does this undermine the spirit of the extension of rent stabilization by the council? Is the question about um, if there's like a CI surcharge and how does, would that apply if, if it's a building wide CI, but there's a number of exempt units, is that the, I guess is the question? Yeah, it doesn't really clarify, but, but you know, that, that makes sense. Yeah, okay. go, you know, can... uh, I, I would interpret it that way, I suppose then. Um, that's a good question, <laughs> if, if that's the question. Um, ultimately, I think probably it would, um, given um, some of what uh, Joe was talking about with the continuation of um, specifically of CI uh, surcharges that um, the housing provider can over time uh, recover the full cost. Um, in that sense, I think it would come from the rent stabilized units. Um, That, that is an excellent question. It may come down to a particular case if somebody uh, can, can some show one way or the other. Um, so I, I don't want to answer that as a universally yes or no, but I would say that that certainly seems likely and seems like somebody, if a CI is coming in a building, may, maybe there's a good argument that could be made. <laughs> 
Um, okay, uh, my next question is kind of a general, um, what should a tenant association board or um, you know, just members of a tenant association take back to their tenants from, from these new regulations? What are the top sort of you know, one or two points that you think are, are most germane? Well, I think I'll probably let OTA speak to, um, to a lot of that. Um, from the Rental Housing Commission's standpoint, um, you know, simply being aware of the new rules and being aware of what rules apply, um, knowing to, to go to rhc.dc.gov and pull up the current rules. Um, and you know, where you have questions, pull up some of those notices of proposed rulemaking to look at um, the commission's discussion. Uh, because if you have an issue, it may have been raised in the comments of why should the rule be one way or the other. Um, and also making sure that um, because these are new, if you're dealing with an issue that's been going on for a while or rent increases that may have been taken before 2021, um, you know, those are going to be governed by the old rules. Um, so you, you're going to need to kind of thread the needle, I guess, on, on which set you're looking at if you're dealing with something that's been happening for a while. Um, Joey or Joel, any any thoughts on like top one to two points? Yes. Um, so I'll add in, Joey, please feel free to add anything else. Um, the, you know, so organizing is important uh, in some instances when it comes to exercising your, your tenant rights. Um, and I have in mind the um, process for challenging a housing provider petition, um, perhaps, perhaps you know, challenge, challenging a voluntary agreement um, even after it's been submitted uh, to the rent administrator as has happened on several occasions by a minority of the tenants where something that kind of fishy or you know, they had some basis to think that it was an improper a voluntary agreement and sh and should be um, should be disapproved. Um, there's a, there's strength in numbers. Uh, sometimes a problem that is uh, noticed and acted upon first by a single tenant really involves a landlord practice that um, involves a whole lot of the units or maybe all of the units in the building. Uh, and this is going to go to a question I'm going to pose to Dan because I forget exactly if if there's an expanding scope rule in the commission regulations i think there is or whether that's only now at, at the office of administrative hearings but tenants should know that they should you you get a housing provider petition uh or and you want to review it and and uh, make sure that it's on the up and up um and challenge it if it's not or um you have the basis for a Kind of group tenant claim for a tenant petition you want to uh, have a tenant association that's uh, effective at getting the tenants together explaining the issue bringing in our great education outreach team as um, as warranted and uh, working together to to um, you know to prosecute your rights un under the act uh, Dan am, am I uh, I'm trying to remember where the expanding scope uh, rule is I think now that it was under chapter uh, 39 so that would be your purview but I, th I think it's also uh, in the OH rules as well I'll just say expanding scope means that a judge ALJ has the prerogative uh, where a tenant petition or a group of tenant petitions clearly uh, involves the substantial rights of more tenants in the building they can expand the scope of that tenant petition in their discretion through a proper process uh, to include all the units in the building. Um, Dan, did I say that right? And what's your understanding of the rule? Yeah, I think that is right. And that's one where um, the old rule um, was a, a little unclear. And certainly, I think people had different ideas about what expanding the scope meant or should have meant. Um, but I, if I'm recalling uh, how uh, we handled the rule and mostly that it's now an OAH question of um, whether or not you need to add in more tenants. Um, and yeah, I think it is largely discretionary to do that. Um, one thing I will add, and this has been something that's come up in a number of cases, 
um, just that I've seen over the years uh, for tenant associations, though, um, when you're filing petitions, uh, membership list, membership list, membership list, um, OAH needs to know who is being represented by the association. Um, that that has become fairly important in a number of cases, and I don't want to go into that too much, but it, it certainly is a thing that's come up. So. Uh, uh, if I may, uh, Nicole, a, a follow-up question for Dan is it used to be, there was a commission decision that um, um, had a scratching our heads a bit regarding how a um, uh, majority of the, the units in a building was counted and, and it went to a literal reading of number of tenants versus uh, sort of extrapolating that it kind of reasonably means number of units. What is, what is the rule now on that? Um, the council did away in 2010 with the rule that I think you're talking about, um, which was that for a tenant association could be uh, added as a party or named in the caption of the case um, if it represented the majority of the tenants in the building. Um, so that's no longer the rule. You can have a tenant association as a, a party to a tenant petition or a, I suppose opposing a housing provider petition also, um, as long as you have some evidence of who its members are. Uh, it does okay. not need to be a majority of the tenants in the building. Um, but to my last point, um, you know, get those names in the record. Yeah, I'll, I'll, so that was OTA sponsored and is in reaction to a couple of different problems with uh, tenant association standing. So thanks for reminding me of that, if it fixed that particular uh, problem, yeah, problem as well in terms of the commission precedent. Um, so I can just jump in here too, as far as top shelf, uh, answering the question of top shelf items to bring back the tenants. Uh, and I'll, I'll say this by way of answering another question that I'm seeing in the chat that I think uh, I think I can answer as well. Um, so uh, the surcharges piece uh, and the calculation of the your standard CPI plus two increase, I think uh, is a really elegant new rule. It just has some kind of mathematical common sense to it. So I really like it. But uh, the idea is that again, um, if you have a surcharge uh, where you know most most of the petition, not all, but most of the petition rate increases are being characterized as surcharges, your CPI plus two percent annual increase uh, would be calculated on the base rent, you know, minus the surcharge, not including the surcharge, and then the surcharge is added on top of that. Whereas before, uh, it was maybe less clear. A landlord might have been uh, calculating the CPI plus two based on the total amount of rent, including all surcharges, and so. Um, I think that's a really uh, good fix that could provide a lot of benefit for a lot of people. Thanks, Joey. Um, so we are getting close to the end here at 2.30. We've got about uh, eight more minutes. So I'm going to take two more questions and then we'll kind of wrap up with next steps. Um, so the first question is going to be, are there any regulations that protect tenants from landlords who neglect tenant safety in the building common areas? And I'm, I'm interpreting safety there to mean more of a crime than a, than a housing code violation. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think there wouldn't necessarily be under the Rental Housing Act part of that. Um, there, there could be. I mean, you could have a good argument um, for some things, especially if it were housing code violations. Um, health and safety related housing code violations are substantial, um, and those are things that you get rent refunds for. Um, if it was more of a question of safety, like crime in the building, um, sometimes that could come from things like broken locks, which do violate the housing code. Um, but in general, um, you know, it, you could have a case where you're making the argument that um, the building has provided uh, a night watchman or something like that. They stopped providing it and crime went up. That could be a kind of related service argument. The housing provider might have any number of reasons why that wasn't a related service, um, but that would just be kind of off the top of my head, um, an example that might relate to um, safety in that kind of respect. Also, I believe, um, 
Joey, we were looking into this question because crime in buildings is a growing problem um, for uh, clients coming in through our intake. Uh, Joey, do you want to talk about the case or just summarize the, the holding in the case uh, goes way back is actually a federal DC decision um, around late 60s, early 70s? Yeah. So just, this is by, sorry, this is just by way of saying um, Dan is speaking to the regulations that might apply, but also there's case law arguments that could be made in some situ some situations um, for tenants holding landlords accountable for um, lack of measures to prevent crime. Right. So uh, I wish I had the case name on hand, but uh, we did find some case law to suggest that um, perhaps if a landlord is aware of sort of uh, very real ongoing uh, safety endangering occurrences, uh, some, you know, maybe people breaking into, um, breaking into the hallways and uh, uh, assaulting folks or trying to get into their units, that the landlord uh, might have some responsibility to uh, put in place some security measures where uh, that sort of thing is, is known and ongoing. Okay, I, I'm being told it's time to wrap up. Nicole Cristobal, is that right? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, as a last question, um, what are next steps? Um, if you have comments on technical to fixes, what should we send them and by when and, and all of that good stuff? Sure, that's a great question. And I suppose I could um, actually pull up those last couple of slides that I didn't get to. I don't want to even really waste a minute on that if we don't have to. So maybe I'll just uh, use the last minutes just to talk. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the commission in working with RAD on updating its forms and you know just kind of final proofreading even after it was final, uh, you know, 211 pages, nothing's perfect, right? Um, and then they changed DCRA to the Department of Buildings and Licensing and, and plenty of other things. So um, we have gone through and made a number of technical fixes under what's called an emergency and proposed rulemaking um, that allows us to put some changes into effect uh, on a temporary basis. So those are in place through February. Um, most of that's fairly dry stuff, but I you know, do have to say, you know, go to the commission's website, take a look at the emergency and proposed rulemakings. Um, if you see something that's wrong or have other technical suggestions that could go into a, a final rulemaking for those technical fixes, um, you know, please do. Um, and comments are due on that actually next week, uh, the 21st, I wanna say, uh, for that emergency and proposed rulemaking. Um, that's kind of the live thing right now. Uh, coming soon, uh, I mentioned uh, the council passed uh, what is called, it's a mouthful, the um, Eviction Record Sealing and Fairness in Renting Amendment Act of 2022. I think I got that. Um, that made a lot of changes to the way notices to vacate work, um, to the way uh, starting an eviction case after notice to vacate works. Um, the record sealing bit mostly that that's for the superior court to deal with. Uh, but there are also now provisions about um, tenant screening that look a lot like and have a lot to do with um, rights that tenants already have and housing providers should have been providing under uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, uh, which is a federal law. Um, so if you're taking an application and running a background check on a tenant based on that application. There are things you need to tell the tenant beforehand um, and after the fact. Um, the things you need to tell the tenant up front are specific now to DC. Um, some extra things you have to give them um, if you reject the application or um, charge more rent or a bigger security deposit or something like that. Um, so there's a lot of little technical fixes that the commission is, is looking at and going through on all of that um, and what goes into notices to vacate and kind of interpreting some of what the commission did um, around both the notices and um, initiating uh, lawsuits for eviction in Superior Court. Um, and just kind of trying to make sure it's all clear and in one place, um, going into um, languages that have to be used when a housing provider gives a notice to vacate, that, that turned out to be a little more complicated. Uh, made some statistical analysis, um, but we, we've come up with uh, the a list of languages that uh, should be used. So that'll be coming out as a notice of proposed rulemaking, um, hopefully soon. I think we're, we're going through a few last steps on um, legal review, 
from outside the office and uh, getting it finally published. But um, keep an eye on the commission's website. That will be coming. I think that's something that's definitely going to be of interest to a lot of tenant advocates and probably to the housing provider side too. So kind of expecting a lot of comments both ways on that one. So stay tuned. Sure. All right, and with that, um, thanks, Dan. And I, I want to remind everybody that the event is being recorded and will be posted on the OTA YouTube channel uh, shortly. Uh, I want to thank Dan and Joey both for excellent, really excellent presentations. Um, thanks to two chiefs, Chief Tenant Advocate Shreve and Chief Judge uh, Gregory for opening the show. Uh, thank you, uh, Education Outreach Team, Nicole and Cristobal for your able assistance. Thanks to all of you for attending and for preventing me from asking questions because you asked so many great questions. Uh, I'm not holding it against anybody, but um, thanks to everybody. Please uh, stay safe and stay in touch. Thank you.